Well, I, I certainly think natural selection is true. It clearly operates. Survival of the fittest is a fact. If you have two organisms and one thrives in the environment and the other one is sickly, you know, obviously the one that thrives is going to be more likely to leave offspring. So natural selection is true. But Darwin wanted to make it the primary explanation for everything we see about living things, all of our adaptations, all the diversity that we see. And here I think it falls flat. Uh, to use someone else's uh, terminology, uh, natural selection may explain the survival of the fittest, but it cannot explain the arrival of the fittest. It cannot explain the emergence of new forms. And many people would say, <gasps> haven't you just given away the store? No, I haven't, and, and you'll see why. And natural selection on its own is not the same as evolution. We needn't be afraid of it. In fact, it was a Christian and a creationist called Edward Blythe who first thought of it, who first wrote about it, and he saw it completely within a creation biblical framework. And in fact, many people think Darwin might have uh, copied some of the, those ideas from Blythe. So let's use this, this hypothetical way of explaining it. Here you have um, these two cats, a male cat and a female cat, mum and dad. And let's say that there are three genes, three different places on the chromosome that determine the length of fur, which means that you've got six, three pairs equal six. Remember, each position is one pair, one from mum and one from dad. And let's imagine that there are only two forms of that gene that determine the length of hair. And I've drawn the ones that are squiggly, they represent genes that spell out, make lots of fur. The ones that are thin like this, they spell out, make hardly any fur. So because each of these cats has three skinny ones and three fluffy ones, then that sort of averages out and they have medium length fur. Now if two cats like that, I call these the Brisbane cats, you know, where it's nice mild climate most of the year, that sort of thing. If they get married, or whatever you put that, then, <laughs> then uh, in their offspring, there are still six positions that must be filled. Now, it's a bit like a roll of the dice. There's no conscious choosing going on, but the offspring can end up with any three from dad and any three from mum. And so you don't need a degree in mathematics to work out that in the offspring, most of them will end up being like mum and dad. They'll end up having medium fur like that. Now, occasionally, some of them will have one more of the furry genes, and so they'll end up with somewhat thick fur. But you notice that when they get an extra thick fur gene, they actually displace, if you like, the possibility of getting as many skinny genes, and so therefore they end up with one less of those thin fur genes, and so on you could go. So you imagine you have hundreds of kittens with all of that variety in them, and you dump them off the back of a truck in a freezing cold Ontario winter. Emile Sylvester would rather be there than in a sweaty Sydney summer, but anyway. You, you will find that at the end of that winter, the ones that are most likely to have survived are the ones that have got more of these furry genes. The next generation, you'll have kittens or cats running around looking more like that. And so the chances of the next generation after that inheriting furry genes is much, much higher. And so it only takes a few winters because you're getting rid of the cats that can't survive that well because they die from the cold. By the way, that's natural selection, isn't it? Survival of the fittest. It, it, it's a fact of life because the fittest are the ones that survive by definition. Like saying the sky is blue, blue is the sky, there's, there's no big deal in it. It's a, just an, an ordinary fact. But after a few generations, you're very likely to end up with a bunch of cats left over that all look like that. Now, what we've seen is natural selection, survival of the fittest. We've seen adaptation to the environment, haven't we? All these evolutionary words, they've adapted by natural selection it's a new type of cat, but have we seen any new information added? And so if someone shows you a process like this and uses that as an example of evolution, can you see why it's not only irrelevant, it's the opposite of what's required from evolution? Because what's actually happened? Sure, we've seen adaptation, we've seen natural selection, but have we seen any new information created? No. Even more importantly, we have seen information lost. 
You see, those cats are now specialised for their environment, but they've become specialised through a loss of some of the information, which means, by the way, that they can't evolve any further back in the other direction. Because you see, if you take all of those furry cats and you drop them off in Sydney at a summer super camp in the early stages, they'll all die of heat stroke. <laughs> Isn't that right? Well, you see the point. You've, you've actually thinned out the information, you, you've made it less flexible, and can you see how important it is if God is creating creatures to survive, multiply, fill the earth, to slow down, if you like, the rate of extinction in a decaying, fallen world, it's very important that he gives them a variety of information to begin with so that they can adapt by natural selection in both directions. Some of them will be able to adapt to hot climates, some to cold climates. But the more that adaptation happens, the more specialised things become, the less change you can get from then on. That's why these thick-furred cats can't easily become thin-furred cats, and so on. So, let's look at natural selection first. Also, sometimes referred to, we like to think of it as genetic variation. We have things called genetic variation. God has programmed into every living creature the capability to be slightly different. Dogs. We have over 200 flavors of dogs, but they're all dogs. We have many different varieties of human beings, but we're all one species. Natural selection. What do we mean by that? Well, we do believe in natural selection. We see it all the time. Natural selection means our ability to adapt to our environment. It also means survival of the fittest. Those are natural selection. But the question is, can natural selection cause new genetic information to be added? Can it cause one kind of creature to change into another? And the answer is no. Why? Because natural selection only works with existing information. It can only select from what already exists. It never adds anything new. And in most cases, natural selection causes a loss of information. Never a gain. Here's what four scientists have to say about natural selection. And they state, natural selection can act only on those biological properties that already exist. It cannot create properties in order to meet adaptational needs. In other words, it cannot and does not create new information. In other words, in our textbooks, we're giving misinformation about how natural selection operates. We're leading our students into the belief that it can cause something new to be added, and it doesn't. It only selects from what already exists. Darwin by no means had the same certainty that today's evolutionists proclaim. He wrote in 1887, often a cold shudder has run through me, and I have to ask myself whether I may have devoted myself to a fantasy. I do think if he had a modern understanding of genetics, he would have titled his book on the survival of species by means of genetic variation. God in his wisdom allowed for genetic variation within each kind of animal to help them survive in a harsh post-fall world, but the price of losing genetic information. Our genetic code limits how much change is possible and natural selection cannot cause an animal to become a different kind of animal. Once I started to understand the extreme complexity of biological systems such as reproduction and information storage in DNA, I was humbled and overwhelmed by God's creative powers and wisdom. Realizing I am incapable of understanding a creator with this type of power, I am thankful God has partially revealed himself through Jesus and the Bible. Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man or birds or animals or reptiles. Romans 1, 20-22